Right. And then Alexander Payne just re- just really explores those questions very well, mm-hmm. uh, where you have to where you have to deal with the juxtaposition of what you hope for and where you really are, the, the reality of your real life. And that's that that's the nexus of, you know, where you get purpose and meaning, um, realize your purpose for being on this earth. Right. Is 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 where you're at. It's not where you hope you, where you wished you were or the person you wished you were going to be. And he's really, really good at exploring that. So my favorite one of, mm-hmm. of the. We're going to devote our energies to sports, and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power coming to you with another Anadromous dialogue, this time with Justin Wells, whom we've talked to before a couple of times, and uh, we're going to talk to again in the future. But today we're talking again about issues related to the movies, a lot of issues related to meaning and the cinema experience. We're also going to, uh, at the end, talk about some of the Academy Award nominees, not so much predicting anything, it's just talking about the meaning of them, what what they signify, what kind of stories were they. And uh, before we do, let me just remind you a few things. One, like, share, subscribe. Two, I am going to Alaska. This is the last video I'm putting out, second to last, uh, before I go. And uh, follow my library diaries. Also, there will be an announcement about needing someone to watch my, uh, to help me sell my puppet books, which I will mail off from Alaska. Someone in Europe and someone in America. And three, let's see, library diaries. There will be an announcement. I will be giving you an announcement of all sorts of stuff happening on this channel and the Anadrome uh, while I'm gone. So look out for that one. That will also contain the announcement about the uh, puppet books. And fourthly, if you haven't seen the new movie, The Dune Part 2, just go see it. Uh, Support film in the theaters. And without any further ado, Justin Wells. Greetings. Hey. How you doing? (laughs) <laughs> Good. Good here. It was a 60 degree day here in Tbilisi, which is for me at this time of year, it's like, this is a heat, oh, wow. which I'm sure for you is nothing. <laughs> 60. Oh, you mean uh, 60 Celsius or? No, or not, if it was 60 Celsius, there wouldn't be anything left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That, that yeah. is hotter than any recorded temperature on earth outside of a volcano, as far as I know. So, right, that's right. I keep forgetting the... the uh... Yeah, it gets weird. The thing that helps me to remember is, uh, well, there are certain things. 40 below is the same in both. Mm-hmm. Zero uh, for them is 32. 28 is 82. So their 28 okay. is our 82 degrees. And, and with that, you know, yeah. pretty good. That's right. 20 is super low. You think, oh, that's pretty cold. No, that's pretty hot. <laughs> yeah, 20. Yeah, well, that's yeah. Yeah. it was warm today. So yeah, I walked outside and I said, wait a minute, am I starting to sweat a little bit? This is this is uh, February 9th. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed oh, to yeah. go chill. <laughs> but actually, yeah. I'm getting ready to go to Alaska. I'll be leaving here on March 6th. So I basically got my, the 12,000 I was looking for. So I'm good. Really? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. great. That's yeah, great. I was I was under a thousand, and a guy called up yesterday and said, "Have a towel." <laughs> so, oh my anyway, God, like, wow! Thank you, MVP <laughs> status. So, wow, are you going to document your trip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've decided I'm going to call it the Cargo Diaries, and oh, uh, that's great. <laughs> all about getting cargo. Uh, maybe I'll form a cargo cult along the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, how how are things going there? Good. It's it's a kind of a slow uh, a slow January. I think things haven't really picked up that much from from the strike. It takes a while for right. people to write things and get them into production. Exactly. 
So fortunately, I got this sitcom that's two days a week just as a camera guy. Nice, easy sitcom. And um, just teaching my documentary class one day a week. Mm -hmm. My documentary class is huge. It's like I I look out and I see 55, a sea of 55 faces. Okay. Um, you know, and then th in teams of top three. Five, so that's, top five favorite documentaries or something like it. Uh, top five of my? Yeah. That my like of all time? Uh, some, yeah. yeah. Some of your favorites. Oh, well. I, I mean, obviously, I'm a big Werner Herzog fan. Okay. Um, I think uh, Werner Herzog made a, a movie. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called um, Encounters at the End of the World. Yes, I did. That's the one about the, the volcano people and stuff like that. Oh, no, he didn't want he did no, one about the volcano people. But this is where he goes to South. I missed that one. Then. The South Pole. Typical Werner Herzog, where he's like, maybe the people down there know the meaning of life. Mm. And so he just goes down and starts talking to people. It's pretty much just him and Peter Zeitlinger, his cinematographer, maybe a sound person. I don't know. Maybe he did sound himself. Right. right. And uh, just asking questions. And um, it's just a brilliant little piece. Uh, it's it's one of his, his lesser known pieces, but it's probably my favorite of wow. his. It sounds great. Encounters at the end of the world. There's a, a sequence where um, he he's talking to a scientist and the scientist is obviously, whenever you interview a scientist, they want to be very serious. They want to mm -hmm. talk about their work. And so he goes, uh, Dr. So-and-so, can a penguin go insane? Can a penguin go insane? And, that's a, and he, that's and a Werner Herzog him. question. <laughs> yeah. And it throws him for a loop. He goes, well, uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> and then he goes, well, they get disoriented sometimes, right? Then there's a sequence of a disoriented penguin with choir music, and the penguin is going this way and going that way. And he says, with 5,000 miles ahead, he's only walking to his certain death. You know, if you picked up the penguin and tried to point him back to the sea, he'd just turn around and walk to his death. <laughs> I would bet he had filmed that before he asked the guy. Because that, that is exactly that's exactly what I, I pose in my class. I show the scene. Right. And, and I show it starts with the interview. Then it goes into the penguin sequence. And I go, what do you guys think? You, do you think that he uh, asked that question and then found the penguin? Or do you think that they already found the penguin and then he went back and asked the question? And um, you're probably right. That's probably, yeah, that's probably good. Yeah, a couple of my favorite documentaries. I think my all time favorite is Crumb. Uh huh. Yeah, that, that's a favorite. And it's a it's the kind of thing I, I watch and, and I come out of it and I just say to myself, yeah, I had a pretty good family. <laughs> My family wasn't yeah. so bad. I mean, yeah, we had a lot of problems, but it wasn't that family. <laughs> yeah. Right. But at the same right. time, it shows someone wrestling with that and coming out to some degree, but also being tainted by the way one is raised. And I think that's yeah. a fascinating thing. And I last year, no, it was uh, two years ago, I found the documentary I'd been looking for the longest. And it's called uh, Le Croisière Jaune. The Yellow Cruise, and it was filmed about 1932 or so, and it was it was made by the Citroen Company. Uh, I think it was filmed a little earlier because it's it's you could tell it was filmed with silent black and white style, and then they added a narrative over it. And I've been looking for it. I saw it once in New York City. Uh, on a on a screen, and I it was this the most fascinating thing, and and it, 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 the Citroen wanted to prove how good their their motors were and such, so they built essentially what is a half track out of a Citroen, and then said you're going to go through the desert, you're going to go up to Afghanistan, oh, and then you're going over the mountains with it, and then you're going to go to China. <laughs> and, okay. And if you start saying, oh, wait a minute, 1930s, wait, wait, wait a minute, you're going, which mountains are those, by the way? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, the big ones. <laughs> yeah. And it's just an incredible, uh, there's, uh, there's a scene when they first arrive in, uh, in Afghanistan, in one of the mountain villages, and you're just looking at all the people, and it's just like, this is like Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. I mean, it's just like, you look at the faces here, they have not changed in hundreds of years. And, and sometimes you still find that there. But then they couldn't get over the mountain. And well, it shows a section where they're driving up these things. You've probably seen uh, William Friedkin Sorcerer. Have you ever seen oh, that? I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. Though. Yeah, well, it's super intense. But, you know, he spent uh, 35 
million dollars in 1975 money on that thing. Uh, but this looks much worse than that. <laughs> and it's real, <laughs> you know, yeah. going up the mountains in this thing. Finally, they, they have to take disassemble the car and carry it over. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, they get stuck in this one kind of uh, valley area. And and then finally, they they uh, get get the Citroen put back together. The snows have melted and they continue on to what at that time we knew as Peking, which we now call Beijing. And it happens to be in the middle of the Chinese warlord era. And there are there are rows of like heads on spikes down the road. It's just this like. What in the world is going on? I, and I saw that. I remember seeing that just saying, like, this is the most fantastic thing I've ever seen. And yeah. I looked and looked and looked. I checked through French Amazon. I, I, it took me a while to find the name of it because I think the English name was a little different. And then finally, about two years ago, they made a book out of a picture book with a couple of Blu-rays, a Blu-ray and a DVD in it. And uh, so I, I bought that and it's all in French. Fortunately, my French is good enough to make sense out of it all. But uh, it's one of these things almost no one has ever seen. And I just oh. was so fortunate that I had seen it when I did in New York. Uh, Film Forum at that time was just like the best theater. So Well, there's there's a, a bunch of movies like that that yeah. are uh, that nobody sees. You know, I've seen films at festivals. It mm -hmm. never got released. Now, whatever happened to that? I want to show that to people. And it's like, can't find it. You know, right, right. lots of stuff like that. Yeah. Well, also but, some of the early works of uh, Miriam and Miriam Cooper and Ernst Shostak before they made King Kong. They made films like Grass. Uh, there's still one I don't have about this uh, uh, tribe in the uh, mountains of Iran who does this ritual every year where they're like they blow up. Uh, sheepskins uh, uh, guts and then go across this roaring river and then kind of drag their whole herd in little uh, makeshift boats across. Stuff like that fascinates me because yeah. you realize now with all of our transportation and communications, um, much of the world is not in any way like that anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it, yeah. it, and you just realize the the, the difficulties of travel, but also the people who are traveling are just incredible. I have a couple of uh, a double record set back in Alaska, which I will be bringing here in March. Or well, I'm I'm loading it in March. It'll take maybe three months or more. I just talked to a man who said his uh, shipment from Montana, a little bit smaller than mine, took 240 days to get here. Oh, wow. <laughs> but it got stuck in Amsterdam and held for ransom. He sent it through an American company. I'm going through a Georgian company. I have a little more faith. But, uh -huh. um, yeah. uh, but, but uh, no, so I have this double record set of the earliest ethnographic recordings on an Edison cylinder by these two German guys. I can't remember their names offhand, who went to every corner of the world to record things. So they were in the Himalayas, they were in Australia, they were in the South Pacific, they were in Latin America, they were in the jungles, they were you know everywhere. Now, when you listen to the stuff today, uh, it's just, you hear these, you know, they're just really primitive recordings. But I've often thought, now there's a movie mm -hmm. following these guys around, this, this the, around 1904 or 1905, going around the world with these guys making these Edison cylinder recordings. I was just like, what in the world did they go through? <laughs> well, that, yeah. So, so that's the explorer spirit. That was the, the beginning of the beginnings of documentary mm -hmm. was that ethnographic, right. um, you know, sort of anthro anthropology type. Uh, and, and that was Nanook of the North, mm -hmm. uh, Flair, Richard Flaherty, you know, he was going and saying, I'm going to document all of these dying, you know, dying cultures or, you know, uh, dying uh, ways of life and, and things like that. Um, and you don't, you're right. You don't get as many of that, as much of that today because of our, of, of the modern world, but right. there, but there are some of them. There's still some enclaves of occasionally um, something will yeah. come out. That's like that. Uh, well, did you see um, honey, Honeyland? which was, I saw it Sundance, I think in 2018. No, it's about this, this woman in Madagascar, in mm -hmm. the mountains of Madagascar. No, not, not Madagascar, uh, uh, Macedonia. Okay. 
and the and I met the filmmakers and they basically just went into the mountains where there's a kind of a village there that there's very few people left. Right. And this woman, it's just pretty much she's the only one left in the village and she was taking care of her her old her elderly mother right. and she would go out and she would find this honey and she would have to climb through the mountains and find this honey and bring it back. And then a nomad sort of nomadic herdsman sort of clan came in and it was the exact opposite. She was kind of like living off the land and kind of like never taking too much honey so that the bees can replenish. And uh -huh. then this guy came in and meets her. And I, I, I said to the guy, are, are, this was not, none of this was staged. This is real. And he goes, oh yeah, this was, we would go up there and film for two weeks and come back and hike. They had to backpack in. Mm -hmm. And then he to go, what does he do? He He's like, well, I'm going to take all of this honey. <laughs> he wipes it out so that there's no honey left. They, they can't replenish it. Right, right. It's almost like two uh, primitive like forms of life. One that is kind of sustainable and one that uses the herd, that has the herds that kind of graze through every mm -hmm. and, and, and destroy. And so then they have to move on to the next place and move on to the next place. And I went, you guys inadvertently captured like the early two forms of civilization or something like this is incredible. Mm -hmm. And they said, yeah, we didn't know what we were doing. We just went up there and <laughs> we're filming. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love documentaries. I have probably, I'm trying to guess, maybe three, four hundred of them in some sort of physical form. And uh, mm -hmm. But then to go along with that, I have about a thousand just vinyl spoken word records and another I don't, several hundred CDs. And I'm really fascinated by these kind of archives, and uh, especially when it involves things uh, that have passed. And you realize this, someone has captured a moment which has now disappeared. And I, th I find that uh, that's yeah. really attractive to me. But also, of course, the stories and uh, everything else. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, things things are disappearing all the time. <laughs> it's, it's, and we're it's... in a moment now when there's so much flux. And, you know, a certain amount of... This is one of the reasons I'm struggling to bring my physical media collection here is because I, I feel the sense of things slipping and I, it's just like, you know, I've spent my life collecting this stuff because it forms a unity. I, I used to work at the radio station in Alaska in the town of Haines and um, I would go there and they have more records than I did, more CDs, although I helped them build the CD library. But I would often say I wouldn't trade my library for yours because the difference is, is you just get what anybody sa sa sends to you. I have curated mine, you know, so that it's very specific and tells a story. You know, my whole collection, I, I, my library in a sense tells a story. So not mm -hmm. that everything is connected to the main ingredients of the story, but nevertheless, you know, if you, if I, I used to buy and sell record collections from people and I could almost, you know, someone would give me, here's some box of uh, the guy who lived in this apartment here. And I would go through it and I started to go like, okay, got into folk music as a kid. Ah, oh, then suddenly switches to Broadway show tunes. Oh, he's got some gay comedy records here. Then after a while, okay, he really liked Elton John. And then he kind of get, then it's like, you can tell he stopped being connected to whatever was current. He had like some new wave records, you know, 80s stuff. And then at a certain point, you can see he's got a few things left and then it's over. And I said, and that's where he died of AIDS. Mm. You know, and you can see in the collection a person's life. So mm. I always found that interesting. Much harder to do with a bunch of files. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I a good person could do it, but it's much harder because... Yeah. You can, when you pick up the album, you can already smell that, oh, this one is a copy from 1961, and this one's a copy from 1980, and you can just see uh, the mm -hmm. difference in production standards and such. So, I, and I like that in movies. I love being able to tell, you know, different, as you know from documentaries, different eras have different things they emphasize. So in the 1950s, you get all those documentaries that are always trying to make a very specific point about uh, what they're they're doing, or even the, those industrial uh, um, social education films, you know what you know going mm -hmm. on dates with people, and you know how to be a high school student, and, and you know every era has the things that it specializes in. And, yeah, 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 um, yeah. I find it I find it fascinating. Um, they 
you know, everybody's trying to, everybody criticizes the, the, the movement before mm -hmm. and says ours is more is now this is more authentic, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was like Flaherty of course was criticized for staging scenes with Nanook of the North. And so then the, the, the cinema verite movement in the sixties, they were, you know, it was a DA Penny Baker with uh, don't look, don't look back. Bob yeah, Dylan. I remember that. I have that. Yeah. And, and, and it was like, no, no, no staging, no staging at all. No, this is authentic. This but is then you watch Bob Dylan and he's clearly performing for the well, camera. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So, so yeah. he's still staging, you know? <laughs> well, with most people, if you put a camera in their presence, I say most, because there are some people who just don't, don't seem to notice, but most people, you put a camera in their presence and you change everything. And a good yeah. documentarian has to uh, lean against that. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, what a good documentarian will do is spend a while with his subject so that they forget about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Maisel brothers were perfect with that. Yeah, I thought. Yeah. Um, but even even then, you know, like uh, in, in Grey Gardens, it you know, Edie, Edie Beale thought that they were going to make her famous. Yeah. And so she had to put on a performance for them in a, in a way, you know, right, right. even then. I mean, and then what happened in the 80s was. Ross McElway and guys like Werner Herzog would say, right. well, you know what? I'm just going to talk from behind the camera. I'm just going to make everyone aware of the fact that this is a documentary because that's even more true right. because everyone knows there's a camera in the room. So why don't I just start talking from behind the camera? And why don't I just talk about the fact that this is a film starts to get this meta layer on top of it, the point of view, I call mm -hmm. it the point of view mm -hmm. documentary um, that basically says, well, you know, might as well just start talking because, uh, and might as well put my voice over and say why I was there. You right, know, right. Now, you know, well, that's it just also intertwines with who they are as people. Yes. Yeah. You know, so. And, uh, and then it, it, their personalities in it. Yeah. 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 Well, I've been working for years on this documentary about puppetry. And one of my problems was, was that all the people I talked to about it said, well, we don't want the documentary about puppetry. We'd like a documentary about one puppeteer. Or we'd like the documentary about uh, your journey getting the, doing the documentary. And I said, look, I know my my story getting the the this documentary is really fascinating, and it is. However, it's like somebody comes to you and says, I've got this great subject for a a, a movie. It's this guy we call him the Desert Fox. He's out in the middle of uh, the uh, the the Libyan desert and he's fighting off the British. And um, it's just this amazing story. And he was part of this other thing, this big war. And because I'm sitting there going like, and, and someone said, well, what's the big war? You see, and, and nobody <laughs> knows about this war yet. Right. And that's how I'm looking at it. It's kind of like, you're asking me to essentially give you a micro picture of things no one has a macro picture of. You know, I'm much more influenced by the world at war here than I am by... Uh, uh, you know, uh, some one of the more, I mean, they really like, you know, we want a story, we want something people can connect to. And I'm sitting there going, well, that's fine. But I'm interested in the information of this thing. So mm -hmm. I've just been, I put this thing together by myself. I haven't put put it together, but I have gotten about 40 interviews with people. I've gotten far more than I need. And uh, I, you know, I couldn't find anyone to come along with me and uh, film it for me. So I just had to get better and better doing it. So some of the earlier footage is not as good as I'd like. But, you know, I say to myself, it's a documentary and you can always find a way to get, uh, you know, make your subpar footage fit in with the other footage. And that's mm -hmm. the great thing about documentaries. You don't have to have the cleanest thing, uh, image in the world. You don't have to, it doesn't have to look super professional, but it, do, it does have to tell a story. But the story yeah. I want to tell is what are these little creatures here? Yeah. You know, where did they, mm -hmm. why are they here? And, and I've also specifically narrowed it down to Europe. And essentially it's the question, are puppets, are puppets art? You know, are they more than just children's entertainment? And the answer is of course, yes. But the mm -hmm. interesting thing is I, as I've gone around and I, every now and then I did this last year, I had a, a Russian puppeteer and a Georgian puppeteer who spoke Russian together. And I did two separate interviews with the Russian who spoke English uh, translating for me for the Georgian. And I've done other Georgians. But I always 
ask a series of questions in all of these interviews. I, I know enough about what puppetry is now to just ace any question and answer session. But um, I ask them to, there are two main questions I get to. One is, uh, what is a puppet? And I usually save that for the end. And the reason I do is because I know it's the hardest question. And it really is. It isn't just these little homunculi or something. Um, and the other one is, okay, so we're surrounded in a world with screens where, you know, kids have uh, smartphones and, you know, you know, people play video games and such. Why do puppets? <laughs> and so I ask these questions. And so... I've got, I'm actually going to do on the, uh, my anadromous site, a series of, uh, uh, I, I call them prophetic voices, where I'm just going to put a lot of just the answers to that second question, because they're absolutely amazing. When you start listening to people talk about why do puppetry in the 21st century, this thing, mm. which is uh, essentially small and humble and doesn't garner a lot of attention um, you know, you, you, it's very hard to get rich making these things. Uh, why do it? And the answers are incredible because they all seem to understand something that a lot of other people don't. And that is, they always talk about it's because it's something real. It's something you can touch. It's something simple. Some, those are the kinds of answers I get. And, um, and in many cases, people say, and there's something spiritual to the creation of these little mirrors of ourselves you know it's it they're talking about a puppet and they're saying it's something real that's very because, because this it's, it's not real it's this, is not. this is this is a screen <laughs> yeah. this is uh uh not tactile you know right what you're doing there and what i'm doing here are tactile but mm. this interface is not and unfortunately i mean i've heard stories recently of uh what was it recently? I heard someone talk about they had a daughter and three doors away was the daughter's friend. And and the daughter and her friend wouldn't go over and talk with each other, but they would text each other at night. Hmm. I thought that's quite odd. But that's where we are. Right. Is there anybody that wouldn't talk with each other, but they would talk through puppets? With each um, other? There are. I read a book uh, by a man. It was called The Puppet. I'm trying to remember who wrote it. I don't think it was the Kenneth Gross book, but it might have been. But there, there was a uh, a man who went over to to talk to a puppeteer, the the writer of the book. He went in. Uh, the his his figure was somewhat well known publicly. I don't know who this was. Maybe it was a ventriloquist. Um, and he went, he, he went there. The man was like, oh, come on in. Glad to see you and such. Went over to the puppet. He looked at the puppet for a few minutes and looked at the man and says, no, nah, puppet's not in the mood today. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, what, what's, do you get into the idea that you can be more honest talking through a puppet maybe? Well, you... there was that movie with Mel Gibson, Jodie Foster movie, uh, The Beaver. And mm -hmm. they got into the whole concept of using the puppet as a psychological tool. And, uh, and, and I suppose there is something to that. You know, psychiatrists have been using puppets to, you know, you're really angry, get mad at the puppet kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's that. That is to say, because puppeteers have a lot of motivations, but a lot of their motivations come from wanting to make the thing the thing the object move that is to say to see uh reality as i i talked to uh the late great puppet historian henrik yurkovsky i spent two days with him in 2012 uh interviewing him and interestingly enough this man had been through the warsaw uprising and uh, when he was 16 years old and 250,000 people died around him and so this guy I, you know, I felt like a great deal of honor being in his presence, having gone through that. But he, I asked him, so what, what is, what do you think uh, it is about puppets? What's so important about them? And he was the, the foremost puppet historian. And he said, uh, 
He says, there are mirrors. And I said, so what, what is a puppet? And he goes like, we breathe life into it. It's a thing we breathe life into it. And I turned to him and I said, kind of like God does in the in Genesis. And he goes, yeah, the Polish man. So, okay, so it's so, something made, <clears throat> excuse me, something made in our image. Yeah, in a strange sort of life way, there, there is this this echo effect, and I think it's from God to us, from to us to this thing, you know. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we can make very destructive things uh, that will come out of this process as well. And I think there's a whole line of uh, that I've been looking at lately. Turns out that um, some of the earliest strings used in puppetry in Greece were imitations of religious festivals and such in Egypt. And they would use these things to, you know, create awe among the people, these little automaton. So, uh, you know, an automaton would have strings connected to it and they would make it move and people would go, ooh. The Greeks saw that, and but what they did is they secularized it. And they said, no, we don't, we're not interested in making it perform for the gods or of the gods somehow. But you see the spiritual thing. But essentially, it shows that in European tradition, the the automatic machine, the automaton, comes actually before the marionette for us. Mm -hmm. And later, in the end of the 18th century, there's a fascinating period in European culture around the time of the Enlightenment, where the automaton becomes the fascination of, of uh, all the upper crust of the nobility, of the, the intellectuals. And there's a whole story right there of many different things. Um, well, what, what's the automaton? The automaton a, is yeah. essentially a puppet-like creature that moves up by its own self. So you wind up, or or okay. it's, it's something that, that once you set it in motion, it'll work for a while. I see, I see. Okay. So a little toy, wind-up toy that, that you know, mm -hmm. is an right. automaton, but is of a very simple degree. But some of these automatons in, um, there's a man, I uh, can't remember his first name, but his last name is Jacques Edros in Switzerland, in the French part of Switzerland, in the town of Neuchâtel. He made some of the most complex automaton ever. And he has one where it sits and writes. And another mm -hmm. one, there is one, I, it's not his, but another one from the same period um and in a recent uh video i did i think I, I showed this one but it's marie antoinette and she's playing a little symbolum with kind of a open face piano in a sense but she's literally playing it hmm. sitting on a chair at this piano like thing and you can see she's actually hitting the strings and this is hmm. all done through clock mechanisms, which is why Switzerland is so important that, uh, to this. And the French part of Switzerland is where, where they made the most uh, clocks, which is where most of the clock industry is at. Oh, wow. So, but what's interesting is the device that makes these things move. I don't know if you've ever torn apart a toy and seen like, like the kind that wind up and you see a little, little barrel and it's got little things sticking out and it, and it goes against something that goes... I don't know. I've done that. But mm -hmm. there's a thing called the barrel and the pin. And the barrel and the pin idea is what makes these work. So there's a there's something that goes around. It's got little teeth in it. Then it hits something, which then hits something else, which makes something move, which is the basic notion. That's also the basic notion of computers. Hmm. So you, if you think back, I don't know if you've seen the old uh, computer uh, cards they used to have, and they all had these holes in it. And it was for the same reason. The whole, the, the computer comes out of this concept of hitting this thing, these little points that makes an action. And what's interesting to me is somehow with AI and robotics and androids and the cyborgization of people and such, Essentially, that that automaton is taking on the religious aspect again. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And here's the interesting thing. The puppeteers know it. The puppeteers know that they are... I, I once wrote an essay called the, the Puppet versus the Robot. 
And the robot is the thing that, you know, it's it's coming for us. The, the robotic, the, the AI, the artificial intelligence, all of that stuff. But the puppet is this very simple creature that is operated by human mechanism, although an automaton can be used in a puppet show. Um, but uh, it's, it's fascinating to me that it's the simplest and humblest of little theatrical devices, although sometimes they are anything but simple. And uh, that's what fascinates me. And the more I traveled around interviewing puppeteers, the more I said, ooh, these guys know what's coming. And there was one guy who also passed away since then, a Czech puppeteer named Josef Krofta. And he said, you know, we have to fight. We're preparing for what's to come. And he Definitely. had been he had been uh, one of the most important puppeteers to kind of smuggle messages in through puppetry in the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia at that time, it, during the communist era in the 1970s. So, yeah, it's a fascinating world, which is why I just like I said, uh, there are a few documentaries about puppetry. They tend to always be about a specific person. Mm -hmm. But. I want to do something that shows what this thing is. And it's a yeah. lot more than any one specific artist can show you. And then, you know, you can go ahead and make all of your documentaries about, about uh, what it is, but I want the overall one. I want the world of war, but not that long. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I mean, are you familiar with the, um, those guys over at the Lord of Spirits podcast, those two, those two uh, Orthodox priests, they have that really popular podcast called Lord Not of Spirits. Really. Well, anyway, they, they they make a claim that the idea of the image, you know, and mm -hmm. then life being breathed into the image was an inversion of the religions at the at the time in the ancient Near East, where they would build an image, a mm -hmm. god, an idol, and then and then have a breath ceremony or something for the spirit to go in through the mouth of the mm -hmm of this and then that basically now it's it's sort of captured in that right. idol and now you can get it to do whatever it does you know whatever you need it to do and sometimes they even chain it down so that it couldn't you know like escape from it or something and and so that the idea of you know yahweh making man mm -hmm. and then breathe life is it like an inversion of that process and so it sounds almost as if you're talking about a reinversion of that you know, like, a, or you could say a return of that in some form of, of the, of the reversal of the image, who, who goes, who makes the image and who, who uh, is the recipient of the breath of life into yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Like I say, I see, I see two processes at once. And one is the, the movement that's going towards the artificial overlord and deity. And the other one is the movement that moves towards uh, the artist as humble servant of, but making, using humble means. And, you know, uh, one of the interesting things about puppetry is the grammar has expanded. Um, I think most people, when they think of puppets in America, everyone thinks of Muppets first. You know, it's just like puppets, Muppets, you know, which is one reason why I didn't use America as my main uh, place of, of, research is because i would have to spend too much time going over that and i don't want to attack jim henson he's a good he was a nice guy and uh, i do have problems with cuteness but this is all you know this is something else so but in europe you can go from the most primitive puppet all the way to the most uh, avant-garde puppet not even leave a country you know, and uh, but, you know, you just travel around. There it is. There it is. There it is. And um, so you get a lot of the history of it. And I was fascinated by that. But one of the things I learned as I first started studying it was that, you know, most people seem to think that a puppet is either a little humanoid thing, a homunculus, or they think it's a animal type image. And then I started seeing people doing something like puppetry with um, rocks, bones, oh. mm -hmm. pieces of wood. I started using driftwood. I started using uh, uh, 
you know, almost anything. I, I did some puppets with mud. I started realizing uh, there's, there's a troop here that does uh, kind of builds little sandcastles and then has little like kind of slingshot things, break them down while they're on fire. Hmm. And I realized puppetry is a great way to show people the nature of physical reality. And the, unfortunately, one hates to say it, but we kind of need that these days, you know, because we have invested so much of our, our life into this screenal existence. And I just have the feeling that that's going to be a problem. It's like, the, I don't know, have you thought much? Have you seen uh, what's going on with the Apple Vision Pro? <laughs> I've seen the ads and the, and the yeah, commentaries. I've, just, I've seen yeah. a little bit of what's inside of it. And I'm sitting there going like, oh, this is getting too close now. And there'll mm -hmm. be, we'll start seeing people walking down the street with this stuff on because it, it's augmented reality. So it includes what you see, but then there's all this other stuff that they're seeing at the same time. Yeah. And eventually it'll probably be contact lenses and we won't even notice. But yeah. I think that for me, it's, it's, it's clear there's a, there's a value to the stuff. There's a value to, you know, God created the world and said it was good. And that is the stuff is good. The stuff he made is good. It has its yeah. limitations. And that's the, what we're always trying to get around is why does it take so long to travel? Why does it take so long to learn things? Why does it take, you know, we want to get over those things, but I think we have to go the, the longer route of learning, which takes interacting not only with the stuff, but with humans in the flesh. So yeah, I, I was There's just thinking this the other day. I was really glad that I actually met you in <laughs> uh, Landau because it's oh, yes. like with an extra mm -hmm. layer of like, okay, yeah, just, all right. Yeah, that's true. I, I rarely have uh, Zoom YouTube conversations with people who I haven't met in person, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if I have. Um, almost, yes, almost every YouTube conversation I've had, I've met the person in person at one point. That's nice. That's so, nice. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that is something. Um, yeah. Well, I, I was researching um, Paul Schrader and transcendental style for something I was doing, and it's slow cinema, basically slow cinema. And he recommended a book, which is on the history of boredom, I think. Or I can't, it's something like that. The title of it is something like Boredom. Mm -hmm. um, it was basically um, tying the invention of the train mm -hmm. to some kind of a psychological shift in the human experience mm -hmm. where you're moving through the world faster than you can process it. And, mm -hmm. and, and also the idea that you... Uh, you want to go somewhere and then you transport and you get there and there's no in between. There's, there's still in between, but less and less. And of course, then with the car, it's even less. And then with this kind of technology, it's instantaneous. Right. And his point was that there's something about boredom that's necessary for the health of the mind, something like that. You know, like the idea that, well, we're going to walk a mile mm -hmm. and then we'll get there, you know, mm -hmm. and you have to walk there first before you get there it's not just instant you're there you know right. um and i suspect that he's on to something that there is something you lose when everything is instant everything there's no in between there's no space for boredom no space for the mind to be occupied with nothing or something like that mm -hmm. you know well actually the word boredom is relatively new and i think the reason for that is because people used to inhabit these liminal spaces differently. They used to, you know, walking down the road was a very different experience for someone living 150 years ago in a village, you know, 300 years ago, almost anywhere than it is for us. You know, I noticed this the first time when I, I had a car back in California and I was going to take a, I was going to uh, work in Montana at uh, Glacier National Park. Anyway, I was moving. The, the why is less important. But I sold my car, but I was still living at the place I was living in. And for a week, I had to take a bus and then get out and walk through this boring suburb to my house and then back to the bus stop, which was about a 20 minute walk. And then I realized I've never really seen this place. <laughs> you know, the place that I'm now walking through, I was driving through it. And 
and you know, you usually had a radio or something on. And but now I'm seeing it very differently from this slower perspective. And I think that slower, I think for us, we get bored easily in the in the bad sense. Um you know, I think television bores us. I think the uh, YouTube bores us. I think all these things bore us, which is why we keep switching to another thing. You know, there's something inherently boring about these images because they, even though, I mean, I think now a great movie is not boring, especially if, if, it's, if it's talking on a subject or a story that you're engaged with is not boring. Uh, a typical uh, uh, television show without much uh, creative guidance behind it, just the kind of thing made to fill up a slot, they tend to be more boring because they tend to, the image, they don't have time to think about the imagery. They don't have time to, you know, they're just producing, you know, it's just like, uh, I like the X-Files, but so many of the early episodes were just them reproducing other parts of the, the country and sometimes the world in Los, it was in Vancouver, you know, in that before they moved to Los Angeles, where they had, you know, they could get a little more hotter imagery and such, you know. But I think that that technology creates a kind of boredom. Yeah, and you know, Jacques Ellul once said, "Okay, so you said, you know, we built this new road, cuts through here, gets there, gets you from this French town to that French town like two hours quicker." What did you do with the two hours you saved? Did you did you write a book? Did you, you know, cook a great meal? Did you, you know, what did you do with that time? And unfortunately, I think these days most people would just simply you know, just kind of hunker down and say, oh. they'd, they'd, they'd be like, I, I watched eight thousand five second videos on my phone <laughs> you know, yeah. that catches my attention and or, or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's this is gets to, to to my documentary, which I'm hoping to finish, just like you, a, a long form documentary about urban spaces, mm -hmm. which is about the in between space, which is yeah, about yeah. you know, and, and it's it's. I just keep running into this experience of um, thinking. Well, I just want to spend some time thinking, or and so I'll go to a cafe, and there's this urgency, like, what do you need? What do you want? What right. can what can what can I get you? Are you done? Do you want me to clear that off? Do yeah. you, can you, are you going to leave now? Like it's this really, really American thing of the agenda. It is very American. And as opposed to, well, maybe I'm just want to sit here for a while and maybe right. somebody come along and then I'll start talking to them. And then, you know, that's a very kind of like old world way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it wearies people because it's like, well, I didn't plan anything right. uh, for this evening. So now I'm bored. Right. I should have planned something. And so what people do is they just pack their calendar full of stuff and it's going one to another. And then when you finally do get to the point where you can reflect and you're alone with your thoughts, that's very rare for people. And it's very unsettling for people. Mm -hmm. And I notice it when people have to endure a slow movie, for example, they have to go in the theater and then they're why what's happening, what's going on. Well, nothing is happening yet. It's slow. You know, and, and it's this thing of like, they have to kind of get taken out of that sort of um, maybe agenda driven um, thing and, and allow their mind to kind of settle down a little bit. Right. And then they can, they pop into, I think you pop into a, a meditative state that's fundamentally different than the agenda state, the, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, going from one place to another, right. accomplishing, you know, something is different, maybe about the dopaminergic system with the way it rewards you when you're accomplishing things and scratching things off of a list versus when you're sort of just sitting somewhere. Right. And I think we're losing some of that somehow. And I see it in the younger generation, you know, it's very difficult for them to sit still. Yeah. Uh, well, we don't see, we're, uh, as has been said, we're running a massive experiment upon ourselves with all of this stuff. You know, it's like people will say, Oh, here, here's your, your little phone. You know, keep in touch. We want to keep in touch with you, little Sally or Johnny or whoever you are, you know, river or butterfly. <laughs> you know, we want to keep in touch with you. And uh, but what they don't think of is, you know, parents don't say, what's the effect of constantly being surrounded by screens for our children? There's no it's very hard to ask that question. Parents are often doing the same, but they're often coming from a time where that wasn't their whole world. 
So they tend to think that eh, my kid will be all right. But of course you see generation after generation where it's like they're surrounded more and surrounded more. And uh, it was interesting. Speaking of slow cinema, I bet when I lived in New York city, I used to love to go see Tarkovsky films, which are slow. <laughs> and uh, I remember the movie Nostalgia came out and uh, I took a couple of friends with me and uh, these weren't close friends, but I figured they were both people who were totally into meditation, new age ideas. They're both musicians, but I figured if anyone could appreciate these people, it's these people who like meditation and stuff. And I took them to see Tarkovsky and it really irritated them. And then I realized, I thought about that for a long time. Why did Tarkovsky irritate them? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought like, okay, well, when they're doing that kind of Eastern meditation and stuff, they're going not into the world outside of them. They're going in. Whereas Tarkovsky doesn't say go in. He starts showing you the world very slowly. He's making you look at it. You know, he's saying, oh, here's, here's a tree. And let's get a little closer. See the tree? Let's look at the branch. Let's get a little closer. You know, this is like a minute tracking shot. And uh, I think in doing so, I mean, I know why he was doing it, because he was exploring reality. But uh, for many people, and, and he knew that there were things to see in those slow shots. But for many people, I, you know, I remember back in the day, we used to use the shorthand of MTV, you know, the video cuts. But now yeah. that just seems like a luxury. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the, when I was in college, the two war movies came out in one year, which was Saving Private Ryan mm -hmm. and The Thin Red Line. And I could divide up, and I was in film school, you know, but I could divide up my friends between the Saving Private Ryan fans right. and and the and the Thin Red Line fans. Right. And it was funny because the Thin Red Line fans, they were fine with Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, but exactly. they love the Thin Red Line. The Saving Private Ryan fans hated hate it the thin red line they're like there's nothing's happening where's the war where's yeah. the action with you know what are these people just staring off into space and, right right and some I, guy in the tall grass looking out <laughs> saying to himself you know yeah. what am i doing here <laughs> you know just like <laughs> yeah um and so I, yeah there, so, so something about that that you nowadays you have to be in a in a in a in a building that that forcefully eliminates all of your distractions. Let's say to watch a Tarkovsky film, mm -hmm. because there's no way that you'd be able to do it at home. You'd you'd start to you'd start to your attention would start to wander to something right. else. You know, right. Last night I went to a, a movie club that a buddy of mine does, and we watched the silent film Joan of Arc, the 1928 Joan of Arc. Yeah, got it. Yeah, and even I was like, yeah, you know, I I'm, I know I'm supposed to go to this movie club, but I'm going to be sitting there for 90 minutes watching, watching a faces. film <laughs> with it's 10 other faces. people. <laughs> and, and so, but I'll tell you, it was after it was over and we watched the film, um, I'd never seen it before. We had right. a great discussion with about maybe it's very, of course, you're not going to get a lot of people to come to this, but there was 15 people or so. Right. Which was great. And I said to myself, I'm so glad I went to that. Absolutely. But I had to overcome something right. in myself to say, okay, I'm going to watch a slow cinema. I'm going to take 35, 40. I'm 40, 47. 47. Okay. So uh, that's, that's, uh, yeah, you're, you're that much younger than me. I'm 68. And so it, there is a, uh, I noticed that as time passes on, you know, I have uh, the, if if I decide I'm watching, like I've got all three Bellatar uh, of his trilogy here. I, I've never watched them and I finally got them, but I'm waiting until, and I'm going to watch them all in a couple of days, but I'm waiting until I'm, I'm at a point during the year where I just go like, this is it. We're going in, you know, and mm -hmm. then I put it aside and then I watch the thing, you know, yeah. because I know this is going to require a, because of the you know, weapons of mass distraction that we are all surrounded by now, yeah. we are, it's so hard for us to stay uh, attuned to mm -hmm. things. There was a movie yeah. 
I, I, you know, I was watching the other day and I said, why does this work so well? Why do I not feel any sense of drift on this movie? I'm trying to remember what it was, but there, and, and often I really like old Hollywood films uh, back in the thirties and forties. They start off and then there's, they, they, they're using, um, stock characters in a sense the character actors and you'd always see you know walter brennan would always play this kind of a, hey how you doing kind of guy and then you'd see some other you know sheldon leonard would always be this prissy like well you know and you'd see these people as soon as you saw their name just in the things you go okay he's in there all right yeah they're going to do their thing uh -huh. but but then i think that one of the big differences was the moguls being predominantly not all but predominantly jewish were really into the story. Whereas the post uh, New Hollywood people from the 80s onwards were more into the bottom line. Story was important for many of them, but they were always saying, how can we solve it? But because of the nature of the studio system, there's a whole way of telling a story that lasts for a couple of decades that it just involves you instantly into this thing you know, it's like there there are certain films from the 1930s and 40s i put them on i'm like i'm there now you know, yeah i don't want to look at anything else i don't want to get a little distraction on my phone it's just calling me you know it's just it's it's familiar but also who was it you know for instance if i compare the lord of the rings trilogy to the hobbit trilogy which is a really unfair comparison but why is that why is it the Hobbit trilogy would be the kind of trilogy that would, you know, certainly by the second film, have me reach in for my my phone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the Lord of the Rings trilogy does not. It grabs me, puts a hook in my nose and <clears throat> takes me along. And there's yeah. something about that. What makes uh, it's part of it is the attention to the story and the way mm -hmm. it moves. And yeah. oh, it was a James Bond film. Yeah. And I was saying, like, why am I, I watching? I think it was, was it, uh, you know, I think, you know, some of the, like, um, Casino Royale and uh, Skyfall in particular. And I was watching those. I, I I watched all the Daniel Craig ones about a couple months ago. And I said, why is this grabbing me? You know, uh, why does it do such a good job? And there are other films that, that do that. But then there are films that are also, you know, huge action films and other James Bond films as well that don't do that. And why, why are we dragged along? Why, you know, and what does it take to set up that kind of a film and to make it really good and worth watching? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I still maintain, I've, I've said this on Twitter that um, you could do a cut of the Hobbit down to one movie and it would be a good movie. Yeah. You know? yeah. If you, if you made people Bill, who have done that. Yeah. And I saw one that was pretty good. If you make Bilbo the main character again, Mm -hmm. and cut out the you know that that one demon guy who's chasing oh, yeah. them cut out most of of uh the extra stuff with theoden and stuff yeah um, and all, make, the, all make the dwarf elf uh yes. romance uh, yeah yeah all that stuff which they had to fill in to get it to three movies because that was what the finances requ were required right um it, that's more like the experience of reading the book mm -hmm. when i remember from reading the book when i was a kid is there's a hobbit named bilbo and you're following him on this adventure and that's it. That's, that's what, that's what, because you identify with Bilbo. He's a little guy in a huge world and you're with him the whole time. You're kind of experiencing it through him the whole time. And uh, so I think you could cut the Hobbit into a good, yeah. a good move. About um, uh, 10 years ago, I did this thing where I decided uh, I've watched the Lord of the Rings all in one day. You know, I, I've invited friends over and said, yeah, we're going to start at, uh, uh, what was it, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning and go till 10 at night because it's about 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I remember one time I said, okay, I'm going to watch the Hobbit, all the Hobbit first and then go to the Lord of the Rings. And as I was watching through the, going through the Hobbit, I was just going like, man, this is really depressing me. You know, it's just it's just going on and on. It doesn't have the and I and I was starting to think like I hope the Lord of the Rings when I get there it doesn't I don't see through it all now. But as soon as we got to the Lord of the Rings, I almost said to myself, "Yeah, they were working on the Hobbit and they finally mastered it with Lord of the Rings." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's something to that. Yeah, you're right. It, there's it, it, there's just a certain um, when when it, it 
if when you can engage with the with the character, I think that's what it is. Like if if it's if it's going if it's if it's supposed to be slow cinema like a Tarkovsky or like Bellatar, right? Then that's a certain experience that they're cultivating, and you're not expecting to be following a narrative that pulls you forward. Not that you know? no. But if you are expecting a narrative that pulls you forward, and then they deviate from it. And they go into very, very long action sequences, for example, yeah. or very, very long chasing scenes. It's supposed to be visceral in some way, but it's going on and on and on. And you're just waiting for it to get over so you can get back to the story. That will cause you to to slip into boredom. Right. Because it's like I, I the whole reason I'm watching is to follow this story. And yeah. now you're not following the story anymore. You're going off on this tangent. And this is irrelevant to what makes this meaningful for me. You know, Well, I remember watching a. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom the second time. And I was just like, I already know the where the roller coaster's going. Mm -hmm. You know, it's already, you know, the action scenes, the, the action scenes now, can we just skip these and get back to the story? Can we get back yeah. to Indiana Jones? That's what I like. Yeah. Um, yes. And I remember, what was it? Um, yeah, when watching The Dark Knight, you know, uh, Heath Ledger is just amazing in that. You know, Christopher Bale does a good job. The plot is great. I just want him to chop out about 20 to 30 minutes of action in that film because it's like, you know, do we need this? Now, they make that because there's certain kinds of fans who just love endless action scenes. And they, I mean, there's certainly a lot worse action scenes. But at a certain point, it's just like ugh, comic book movies. <laughs> That's how I felt watching the super, the um, Zack Schneider Superman movies, where it was just like, OK, I've seen a lot of punching and people flying backwards and crashing into buildings. Right. And I'm like, I've seen enough of that. I, I know. <laughs> yeah. There's well, a that, certain, yeah. that comes from the form as well, from the comic book. Mm -hmm. Many comic books would have a section in them that was just action panels. You know, they'd often be jagged panels and things like this. And uh, there were people who really liked those kinds of comics. And, um, you know, and particularly in the Marvel you know, all the Marvel geeks were really into that. And they would talk about, oh, this Spider-Man, he does this and does that. It it feeds a certain kind of uh, appreciation. Mm -hmm. But I, I was always like, no, I, I like the story. <laughs> you know, give me the story. The action yeah. is like, it could be great action. But but to me, if it doesn't serve the story, I'm mm -hmm. a lot less interested. If it suddenly starts to take on a life of its own apart from the story, you know, mm -hmm. then I'd rather be just watching uh, some kind of sport, like, you know, know, hot rod races or something, you know. I'd well, there was the one time that, I mean, maybe it's a, a question of how long you should do it, like right. give a little bit of action, but if it goes on too long. But the one movie was that didn't do that for me was the Tom Cruise um, remake of, or a sequel to um, the, what's the flying movie? Uh, Top Gun. Right. Top Gun. Right. Yeah, somehow. Yeah. But and that I, was all integrated totally into the story. Yes, but it was also real. Like mm -hmm. they were really flying those planes. And so, and knowing that and watching the G-forces interact with the, their faces. Exactly, uh, exactly. You know, that well, there was they, something we, at stake. Yes, yeah. And so there's something very, I mean, going back to what you're saying about puppets, we, you, there's somehow we can tell the difference between a real stunt and a CG stunt, even if the CG one is almost in like, like just as good in terms of believability right. on the surface as a real stunt, there's just still something about a real stunt, something about it, them really having to do it with, with Tom Cruise always, you know, right. jumping off of a motorcycle or flying on a plane or something where you could probably recreate that in such a way that he's not really having to do that, but there's still something about the real Mm -hmm. That is more compelling. And especially we know it. Mm -hmm. You know, we know Tom Cruise is doing this before we go in. And yeah. so then you start looking at it as you're going, like, whoa, his face is really being blown up by the on the side of the airplane and stuff. Or it's like Burj Khalifa. Yeah. That's really high, you know. And such. Yeah. one movie I really did like, and it was all action scenes, and it was the, the, from last year, it was John Wick 4. Did okay. you see that? No, I haven't seen. I, I mean, too ab yeah. I mean, as far as action films went, that was the top of the heap for me last year, and they did something interesting where that, where, I mean, it's endless action scenes, and yet they all kind of work because it's working on a different principle. 
it's that somehow the action relates to the character. So there's one scene at the end where they're trying to get up the uh, the steps of uh, Sacre Coeur in France. And this is a long, 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 long stairway, series of stairways. And he has to go up and fight his way up and up and up and up. And it's just endless shooting and stuff. And then at a certain point, he gets knocked all the way back down. <laughs> it's I don't know if you've ever seen Tarkovsky's Nostalgia. Nostalgia. Yeah, I haven't seen that one. And at the end where this guy is trying to carry a candle and he's just trying to put it at this one place, but he's got to keep it lit. And he goes through it three times. And by the third time, you're like, come on. And that's how you felt watching the John Wick movies. Just like, oh, no, he was almost there. And then he got literally knocked all the way down the stairs. It's like, and it's just, yeah. it's, to me, I uh, that movie was very different because it was basically saying there is a poetry to this yeah. act. And the poetry reflects the characters and it's not a real world. That is to say, no one's sitting there going, this would never happen. So you're yeah. not looking at it that way. You're looking at it the way you would look at, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or something. It's got its own, the movie, it's got its own mythology. I really like all four of those. But that one, somehow, they took a very good premise at the beginning and ramped it up and got totally better by the fourth one. And the fourth one's much longer. It hmm. should. It has no right to be as good as it is, but I thought it was just excellent. So, oh, well, I've been meaning to watch all of them. I, that's why I had, didn't see the yeah, fourth. Yeah, yeah. So and, I wanted to watch them all. Yeah. And yeah. you should start at the beginning. And uh, yeah. third one is where you start to say, eh, I don't know if they can continue this anymore. But then they come back with the fourth one and you're like, oh, my goodness, this is incredible. Yeah. Part of it is, though, they, the characters they add. So they have a blind assassin, a blind uh, Chinese assassin who knows all the stuff. But He's not always just this perfect fighter. Occasionally he does things, and you know, and John Wick is not always graceful in killing all these people. Occasionally he have, he gets shot and killed, and you, you feel like he's a pincushion after a while. <laughs> and mm -hmm. but anyway, that's it's I have a weakness for those films. But but and and so that's interesting. And I say to myself, why does this work? Whereas so many other films that have, you know, endless action scenes don't work. And yeah. part of it is I know the work they put into th thinking about those action scenes so that they are, they weren't uh, extraneous to the plot. They weren't just, we need this. Yes. There were certain movies, I think it was, uh, was, was it Spectre? No, it was the other one, Quantum of Solace, what happened during the last big writer's strike in L.A. So what they had done was they had actually uh, gotten... Um, uh, They'd come up with all the the action scenes for the movie in uh, Quantum of Solace, but they didn't have the linking script yet. <laughs> and so that film feels weak because then suddenly the strike was over and then there's, they're, they're patching it all together. And they were more interested in that particular uh, James Bond movie in the actual uh, action scenes rather than yeah. the, the character. So well, that's probably the yeah. lowest one of all four, five of the Daniel Craig ones. And and what I know from the business is that quite often what will happen is the the second unit director and the first unit director are running separate units. Right. So the second unit director is directing all the action scenes, and then the first unit director is directing all the all the acting scenes. Right. And so um, there is a, a phenomenon I think where you can have a runaway second unit, all the budgets there all of the uh you know set pieces are there mm -hmm. and the second unit director is just going to do their thing and oftentimes these second unit directors are former stunt coordinators so they're not necessarily interested in story no. they're interested in, in achieving these these action sequences right. and so i think what has to happen is that the first unit director has to be really intentional about integrating those action scenes into the narrative right I think someone who did a really good job was when I worked with Phil and Chris on the Jump Street movies, 21 and 22 Jump Street, where we would have these action sequences that would have little jokes in them. You know, it's right. like they're chasing and then they, you see this this truck with all of this, you know, flammable stuff on it, danger flammable. And then Jonah Hill goes, oh, no, it's going to explode. And then it doesn't explode. And he goes, oh, wow, I really thought that was going to explode. You know, like right. little jokes that they put in put in the uh into the action sequences and it just kind of like integrated the whole thing. Not right. that those are 
the paragon of, of, of amazing movies. But this was a, a little thing that I learned was that, yeah, you, you can't just let those second unit um, action sequences kind of go on autopilot. You really have to work to integrate it because no one's going to do it. No one's going to do it. Right. You know, the producers, the studio, they, they're not going to worry about that. They're just going to worry about those elements being in place. Right. And so I think that sometimes it requires someone with a little bit of uh, authority to say, no, we have to find a way to integrate this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, in uh, Stanley Kramer's uh, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, yeah. uh, all these great comedians were brought in to be part of this film. And when they came in... Uh, they were handed a screenplay about this thick and then shown about uh, an hour and a half's worth of footage that had already been shot by the uh, second unit directors of all the stunts in the movie. Mm -hmm. And then they said, uh, you know, the, the stunt coordinator, I think it was Yakima Kunut, handed them this and just said, now it's up to you to make this film work. <laughs> you know? Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Stanley Kramer was in charge of the whole thing. He was a very yeah. notoriously uh, hands-on guy. But but uh, so all the, uh, I, I've seen interviews with the comedians from that time. They're all the classic vaudeville type comedians from the early, late days of television, er, you know, early 60s and stuff. And they're all going, jeez, we got we to gotta be better than that. <laughs> Because it was a pretty, pretty spectacular footage done in a, a pseudo Cinerama. Well, it was put in Cinerama theater, so it was like super wide. Uh, yeah, you know. And did it did it wind up working? I remember seeing that yeah. as a kid. No, that's a great film. It's one of my favorite. Yeah, films. yeah. I saw it as a kid, and, and then later I would see uh, critics who dissed it, saying, "Yeah, it's not that good." And going like, "What are you kidding? It's you know, you know, look at what these guys are doing there. Watch, look at the action scenes, but also look at the." Uh, the actual uh the comedy in there it's just incredible you know and mm -hmm. it's one of the films i can watch all the time so yeah but it, that's a, also a black i saw it on an original uh not a full cinerama screen but a pretty wide one when i was a kid one of mm -hmm. the first ones that was adapted in that format right yeah so uh i don't want to take this out too long we've been here almost an hour and a half an hour and 20 minutes or so why don't we talk a little bit about uh, thoughts about the coming Academy Awards? Have you? Do you have any thoughts about oh. who, who you think might well, win? Oh, I don't know. I don't know who might win. That's all. Or what you would like? Um, uh, well, you know, I watched American Fiction last right. night, which I, I don't think you've seen, but no, um, it was it it confirmed for me again this this weird moment we're in where. It's it's like narratives on top of narratives on top of narratives, and right. everything is so meta. Everything is use, so meta. Would you use the phrase meta modern? Yes, <laughs> it was absolutely meta modern. It's like, you know, American fiction. He's a novelist in it, and mm -hmm. then he covers a certain fiction, which right. is pandering to a certain demographic in the novel, and then he uncovers it. But then he realizes that he can create a fiction that will that he can profit off of and then but he kind of peels back that and then it just keeps going and going layers and layers and layers of 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 fictions right uh, that people are using for to profit off of, to benefit right. from you know not only fictions in terms of movies but it fictions in how you present yourself like what your what your right. life is and barbie is like that um you know there there's a lot of different movies that are dealing with this mm -hmm. this notion of narrative almost like a questioning the value of narrative itself because of that super embed postmodern embedded notion right. of narratives as power structures you know um so people are really questioning it right now and so i think that the academy awards this year is going to be kind of like a little window into how hollywood is thinking now about themselves right. uh, about the, the the notion of narratives themselves because they 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 have allowed themselves to get kind of captured by political interests mm -hmm. in crafting their narratives over the past few years. Right, right. Now they're starting to question that again. They're starting to say, "What's the value of it?" Um, so I, I don't really necessarily think I'm not super like, "Wow, there's some amazing." Some of these movies are super amazing this year, but I do think that there's something new that's going to come. Yeah, I do too. This questioning, this existential moment of of uh of of self 
I don't know, a self-examination or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. Uh, well, we talked all about a lot of the things that we're changing this year. And just to let you know, I'm going to put this on the anadrome channel rather than okay. the anadromous channel, just because that's going to be more my uh, film music and media channel and mm. uh, arts channel. So uh, it won't get as many views to start, but it will in the end. Which is why I'm glad we're, we're having a general discussion because I think that will be helpful. But I'm also going to tell all the people over on the other channel, hey, go go over there. I'm, I'm trying to yeah. go over there. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, did you see Anatomy of a Fall? Yes. And what was That's your, another one. That's another one. That one either. It's, it's all trying to reconstruct what happened uh, uh, happened in the past mm -hmm. you know a, 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 is it an accident is it a murder is it you know and so again it's this idea of like how where how do you find the truth of of some of a narrative of a right. story you know um and 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 so it, I, the, I mean the bottom line for me is if the if the only benefit from a story is what you can get out of it, you know, like how, how you can benefit from it status wise, monetarily, um, et cetera. That's what people are really wrestling with is, you know, is there a genuine story underneath all of these fictions right. or all of these narratives or, you know, is it just turtles all the way down, mm -hmm. you know, or is there an, a, a real authentic story that you can get to, um, that's what people are kind of wrestling with, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in, in the, in the art world. Right. Um, and also in life, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what people are wrestling with in life too, is, you know, is there a story that you can engage with a narrative that you can engage with that is really real, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like your, your, your puppet. I, you know, it's like the puppet is fake because it's a puppet, but it's real, you know? And right. so pe people are, that's what people are wrestling with, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, to me, one of the interesting things about the year is uh, Megan, the android, Barbie, the doll, and then Poor Things. Did you ever catch up with Poor Things? No, I didn't. I didn't. I did. I just saw it. Uh, oh, it came okay. here. And it was really the hard R rated version of those other ones of Barbie, particularly. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it's the doll person. It's, it's the woman as Frankenstein's monster. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's also interesting is it's very similar in some respects to the old Voltaire story, Candide, where this person who goes through life always optimistic is constantly being bashed down by things and yet still keeps coming out optimistic. And so uh, very much almost like a Marquis de Sade plot. It's like, <laughs> if you can imagine, uh, and, and, and uh, it has that weird kind of feeling. I mean, the, the whole thing is a totally uh augmented world it's it's not quite our world it's not quite our past there's all sorts of obvious it has a very theatrical uh pageantry in the background the settings and the stage design and such so uh it's not quite as artificial as the barbie backgrounds but mm -hmm. it's and there are cases where it's not that far off either so mm -hmm. uh but it's also it's what's strange about it it's really dark and when you get to the end, if you look at it from certain eyes, you're just going to be saying, well, but the Emma Stone character in the middle is always adapting to everything, finding the best in the fact that she got you know, and ends up as a prostitute. The fact that she, I mean, she starts off like a baby. And she's a baby you know, throwing things and hitting things and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And she ends up as a woman again. The thematic relationship to Barbie here is interesting. Um, I think it's an important film uh, for the times. I think all three of these are are very important. And you can drop Taylor Swift in the middle of this stew. It's a very interesting year for, you know, what is a woman? That question That's... resounds in all, all of these movies, you know, yeah. including Taylor Swift. What is a mm -hmm. woman? Uh, I've often thought Taylor Swift has not, she is, She's uh, been very LGBT, uh, uh, you know, in several of her songs. But when it comes down to the J.K. Rowling's question of can this biological man 
become, you know, is it the same as if, say I'm a woman, be the same as a biological woman? I have the feeling Taylor is on the J.K. Rowling side. She just doesn't want to say it out loud. You know, mm -hmm. that is to say she's not, you know, she's out there, but not quite as far out there as, as she would, you know, I think, uh, anyway, I don't want to get into a whole Taylor Swift thing, but, uh, but nevertheless, I think that she's important to this whole thing. And uh, let's see, what other uh, Oppenheimer thoughts? Oppenheimer, yeah. Um I don't, I mean, I, I love the movie. It doesn't relate to the, every, all the other movies that are wrestling with this idea of who we are. Right. The narrative. I mean, it does in a way, in the sense of, are we monsters? Right. You know, are, are, you know but that's more, it's, it has to do with technology and the, the relationship to technology, the relationship to technology and power. Um, and that's, I mean, it, it, I think, I think, that one's an important one too. Right. Um, the, the, the technology is just moving so fast that we forget, we tend to think that just progress is good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but the fact of the matter is that almost every time a technology first comes out, it's used for evil. You know, it's like the first time the internet comes out, 90% of it is porn. You know, right. the first time, you know, people invent, could smelt metal they made weapons you know right, so right. there's this weird relationship where um it, it is kind of the knowledge of good and evil like getting getting knowledge before you're ready for it right knowledge of technology before you're mature enough to handle it you're gonna mess it up you're gonna use it it's gonna be it's gonna be bad you know the idea of being able to to integrate something you know well, in a way, it relates to uh, many of the conundrums we're facing with AI right now. Mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a different kind of technological uh, line in the sand. But nevertheless, we're at a, at one now. And uh, you know, what is going to happen with all this artificial imagery? We don't know. You know, it's yeah. just it's still developing, and that along with uh, what's going on in the VR augmented reality world and the rest of that. These are all going to be huge questions. So to me, it does relate, but more from a historical perspective, like you were saying about technology. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, that, well, go ahead. Oh, well, tech, um, uh, Neil Postman wrote a book called Technopoly in the early 90s. Neil Postman, who wrote Amusing Ourselves to Death. Right. And I've always found that his approach to technology was pretty good, which is you don't have to be a Luddite but you should be skeptical, exactly. you know, like, like you, you don't have to be like an Amish person and be like, right. no, no new technology, but you should always be skeptical yeah. of whatever the new thing is. You should be skeptical of it yeah. because it's always going to smuggle in something. Right. And I think we, I feel it's not incumbent upon me to be an early adopter. I'm usually a later adopter. I watch people and see how do they get along? So now I have, I finally got a smartphone a couple of years ago. I only started working at the beginning of 2023. And, but what's interesting is they go like, I see the problem. I don't want endless apps interrupting me. And that's what a lot of people have allowed to happen. So that the apps are constantly saying, look at this, do this, do this. So the only things I have is basically when people are trying, you know, I'm not going to even ride the bus and watch YouTube videos. You know, I'm going to, even though I have a stake in it with a channel and such, but uh no i'm gonna i can wait till i get home there's nothing no, for instance there's nothing that anyone on twitter or x twitter or whatever the hell is nothing that anyone is going to write there that i need to pay attention to immediately i can read them but it's, okay whatever uh the only things that i may may require my actual attention apart from the weather are email and uh Maybe because in Georgia, Facebook is often used as a primary mode of uh, communication for daily things. Those two are the only ones. So the rest of them, I can just put aside and watch them if I need to, but I don't need to. So uh, that's how I uh, deal with it. It's just like, okay, I've watched it. I've seen, okay. And it's not to say that all the apps are bad. Any one in particular is probably yeah. interesting. But it's yeah. just how much are you, you know, what does it, uh, Paul say, use the world, but not to the full. Yeah. 
to not yeah. use everything, to try to get all the advantage, you know, mm -hmm. because. Well, the, the problem that I find is that if you, once the technology comes out and then we, as a consequence, lose something, you mm -hmm. know, like we, lose, for example, certain elements of socialization where everyone's now on their phone instead of somewhere where else would they be? Like when my grandfather used to go to these barbershops singing afterglows where everyone's out singing right. until three in the morning, mm -hmm. that's gone. Right. You're not going to find that anymore, you know, or like the Christmas markets. When I went to Germany and I right. went to the Christmas markets and it's like, everyone's in this little Christmas market. It's cold out. Right. Everyone's outside and tight. Yeah, you know, and it, I'm, I'm thinking, first of all, that just could never happen in America. Because we don't have the cultural heritage for it. We don't have the legal spaces where you can put all that set up that stuff up. Right. And plus it's not that cold, so you don't need to do all this stuff. Right. You know? Well, so certainly it, not like, that cold in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. But it arose in a way because it was so cold and so everyone wanted to gather together. There's this body heat kind of packs right. you in. So, you know, it was just a magical experience, this Christmas market, I remember. And I just remember thinking, how in the world could I ever have this experience? in the future because right. this is a this is an experience i'm having from the past right you know well well the problem with being in uh, la is in many ways advanced and also because of all the traffic there and there's no way to magically get yourself across the city without you know okay we'll be there in two hours you know kind of thing so you you've got you know and then are the people in your immediate area close close enough to you to join to you see i'm fortunate right. here in georgia I can call friends over. I went, someone invited me to a philosophical supra. Supra is a traditional ritual meal. And it wasn't done in a super traditional way, but it was done with many of the, the highlights of, of this kind of ritual meal. But it was also all a philosophical conversation. Mm -hmm. And that was great. That yeah. was just great. You know, and I just like, yeah. that's why I'm here, <laughs> you know, because I yeah. want to, I want to keep this stuff alive with the stuff in yeah. reality you know yeah okay yeah, people they won't do anything unless they have to yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. did you see past lives yes yes and did you love it as much as many people seem to i did not see it um well again i i, I didn't i thought it was interesting mm -hmm. but i didn't love it right <laughs> it, 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 but it, it i think what it is is that these movies this year surprised me in what people were wrestling with, you know, and it's this wrestling with identity, wrestling with the, the, um, again, like the modern thing of the paradox of choice, right. you can choose anything you want, but what we don't understand is that is the minute you choose some, the, when you don't choose one path, one life path, um, that means you don't live any life path, right. you just keep flitting around from one to the, to the, to the other, you know? And so this was really a, a lament of a life path that wasn't taken, mm -hmm. you know, a life path that could have been. Mm -hmm. But there's a sense that um, the life path that could have been would have had a lot of rewards, but it wouldn't have had as much opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what we're always striving for more opportunity, more choice, more um, more this, more that, you know. And but people in the past, they didn't have those choices. And so they had to they had to find meaning in where they were in the limits of their world. And when you take the limits off, that's the weird thing about modern life. You take the limits off and it, now the meaning kind of diffuses mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's like, well, you know, I'm going to go be this. Now I'm going to go be that. Now I'm going to try this. Now I'm going to try that. Right. And you never get very deep in anything, including, and in this case, including relationships, right. you know, like, like uh, she um, was living in a different culture right. far away from where she grew up and, the, the person from her past, the old, uh, the childhood friend represents the, the depth of who she is, you know, but she left that behind, you know, and she went off to New York to pursue other things. And so now her relationships are very shallow, although mm. she's very successful. So it's this kind of like, you know, I think it's, it's, again, it's like wrestling with different forms of value, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's what people are realizing is that whatever, you know, progress, choice, opportunity wealth right. um you know all these things that you think are automatically good new technology mm -hmm. even you know all of those things right um you they might not be <laughs> they might not be the best for you and that's what people are wrestling with i think
Have you seen Maestro? I haven't seen that one, no. I did see that. And uh, I thought Bradley Cooper did a very good job all the way around. However, and here's the big however, uh, he almost does the thing that some actors do. And Jim Carrey did this in Man on the Moon, where they literally just become the mm -hmm. other person. And they inhabit them so much that so, there's something about that to me is strange. This this imitation of uh, inhabiting the person so much that it's missing some breath inside of it, you know, especially with, uh, well, I know uh, Leonard Bernstein's lectures. I know his music. I know a lot of things. What was interesting to me is the whole film really focuses upon his relationship to his wife, but really focuses on his homosexual desires. So to me, the whole life of Leonard Bernstein was boiled down to basically questions of sexual identity, which to me, I've never gotten that from, you know, listening to Leonard Bernstein's lectures about music or watching his compositions and such. And it's a difficult thing because, of course, you know, people, you know, we want to know about this, you know, what about this? But I have the feeling someday we might get a different version of it, which deals more with the substance of what he did as opposed to uh, the kinds of tensions that he had in his life on a sexual level. We've gotten to the point now where we think the sexual part of us is the most honest part, which I think you could make a good case where it's, well, maybe publicly it's one of the least honest, you know. Mm -hmm. It might be very yeah. honest. Who knows? We're, we're often playing chess games with each other. You know, that's maybe that's Freud's fault. Boiled everything down. To... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, zone of interest. Oh, I forgot the holdovers, which I think you've seen and I haven't. Oh, yeah. I, I love the holdovers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm a big Alexander Payne fan. Right. And a big Paul B Giamatti fan. Right. Um, Did Alexander was... Payne do Sideways? Was that him yes, too? it was. Essentially, um, very in the same vein as Sideways. Right. Um, but there's something about Paul Giamatti trying to find meaning in life mm -hmm. and, and being a little bit of a loser. Right. Uh, you know, like in Sideways, you know, he's an English teacher. Right. And an alcoholic, basically. Right. right. <laughs> and and he just it, but yet um, he he find he's able to connect with one woman magically who understands something ab about him some potential mm -hmm. in him you know mm -hmm. um and in this case he's a a, a teacher who di didn't make it to teach college so he teaches high school and he feels kind of like a loser in teaching his alma mater high school right. but he has to he has to stay over the week over the christmas break with a a student who is uh he doesn't have anywhere out to go you know because his family is divorced and, and whatnot right. and um it's it's kind of like both of them trying to wrestle with the disappointment in their life. Like things didn't happen the way the narrative, again, it's like a narrative. It's like, this is the narrative of how your life should have been. You should have right. went to college and then you should have got your degree and then you should have moved up. Right. But here you are, you went backwards and now you're, so Paul Giamatti, first of all, does a very, very good job of that. Right. And then Alexander Payne just, just really explores those questions very well mm -hmm. uh, where you have to, where you have to deal with the juxtaposition of what you hope for and where you really are, the, the reality of your real life. And that's the, that's the nexus of, you know, where you get purpose and meaning, um, realize your purpose for being on this earth right. is, is, is where you're at. It's not where you hope you, where you wished you were or the person you wished you were going to be. And he's really, really good at exploring that. So that might've been my, my favorite one of, mm -hmm. of the, you well, know, is, uh, a, lot subtle, of, subtle. a lot of people are saying best actors between Killian Murphy and Paul Giamatti. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Uh, what which was what, one? Killian what do you Murphy? want to win? Uh, oh well, I, I you mean, I Paul. you want Paul Giamatti? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's just because I have a, an affinity for it. Well, for a lot of people are saying this might be his year simply because he's been good for so long. Mm -hmm. You know, he hasn't he hasn't won anything like this. This might be the only chance they have. Whereas Killian Murphy still has, you can tell he's got a, a ways to go. But he yeah. looked very good yeah. at playing uh, the rather amoral or or was it immoral uh, 
uh, Oppenheimer. And I've always known, I've known about the Oppenheimer story for a while. And I've always known the guy was a womanizer who was, you know, uh, you know, it's just like, what was, the, what's the relationship between a person whose own personal sense of morality has kind of deteriorated while they're also looking at these big level scientific questions. And Walker Percy yeah. says, you actually can't divorce those two things. Mm. That the person at home is mm. the same person looking through the microscope. And he says, are you really telling me that a, that a, a scientist in Los Alamos is going to find meaning in the world if they're burning through all their human relationships? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. that is, yeah. that's what they're going to see is behind everything. No, he says they, they can't because in doing so, it would upend their personal uh, existences, what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, everything is integrated yeah. that way. But I did think that, uh, for my money, that was the best Christopher Nolan film. So, yeah, it might have been. It might have yeah, been. Yeah, yeah. he's done a lot of good films, but he's yeah. also got a bit of that thing that Kubrick had of making things a bit cold. And well, that's he's he 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 doesn't mind exposition as yeah main thing like information most right. people want to get through the information so they can get right. to the story he he relishes the information yeah you know and i do too i i'm a big exposition fan but but uh yeah um killers of the flower moon didn't see that one yet i mean to see that and uh i did think i thought it was good although it does kind of end up with a white man bad kind of thing i think scorsese is trying to make up for the uh, atone for sins. However, I will say that the acting is excellent in it. And yes, mm-hmm. it was a horrendous time. And uh, I thought uh, Lily Gladstone, she should win for best actress. I just thought she was, well, the thing about her is I lived around, uh, among uh, Clinket Indians up in Alaska. And I know these people. That is to say, mm-hmm. she, she was like the best Native American woman I've ever seen in a film really captured the kind of the spirit of a Native American woman. Not that they're all the tribes are the same, but there's a certain, you know, there's a certain kind of really low key sense of humor that they have. There's a certain kind of, uh, and, and uh, I have my problems with the film, but I thought, I thought it was a very solid film. It just, uh, there were some points at which I would go, eh, okay. And Robert De Niro, I thought did a very solid job. Uh, uh, it was a little, uh, yeah, solid, more solid than a lot of stuff he's done in the last 10, 15 years. So, mm-hmm. um, and I think Zone of Interest, did you see that? I have not seen that. It, didn't see that one, no. Okay, so we'll say that one's going to win the best picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, what have we got here? Okay, actor, like I said, I think it's going to be uh, one of those two. Uh, I think Robert Downey Jr. probably has the uh, supporting actor thing sewn up although people no anyone who says i just saw poor things mark ruffalo should not get it and i don't think ryan gosling is going to get it for barbie robert de niro's got too many awards already so and sterling k brown in in american fiction was that uh oh well he was good um but i don't know the actor awards you're not as invested Um, yeah i think it's either going to be lily gladstone or emma stone bunch of stones uh and uh let's see i was really glad to see godzilla minus one get a nomination yeah just just any nomination you know yeah visual visual effects for a 15 million dollar story yeah (laughs) yeah yeah um any other thoughts about the movies of last year that might have showed up in the academy award uh no, I don't think so. Um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch, I think, this year. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I think we've gotten to a point, and I think that's with uh, Barbie being uh, a, a, such a strong film this year, and Oppenheimer as well. Uh, it, there's a little bit for, you know, there's a little bit to root for, in a sense, for people, mm-hmm. even though, you know, I'm not rooting for Barbie to do much. Uh, yeah. And of course, there's all these people who say, like, how come Greta Gerwig didn't get the best director? Because <laughs> she didn't. You know, people people often yeah. will say, well, Hollywood snubbed her. And I said, well, Hollywood isn't like one group of people who are sitting around going, who are we going to invite yeah. out of the clubhouse? Yeah. Because that's it's all these people doing private little ballots, and that's just what yeah. they design, you know? Yeah. And uh, Well, and, and ever, ever since... Um, 
ever since Harvey Weinstein uh, rammed through, pushed through uh, um, Shakespeare, Shakespeare and love, Shakespeare and love, the politics <laughs> of, yeah, of yeah. that has it, changed. It won over Saving Private Ryan. It's just like yeah, that. but it was because of his his tactics of secretly having these parties, and right. you know, technically, like you're not supposed to be able to like solicit or but he'd say well i'm having a par- i just happen to be having a party and i'm inviting all of these people over and you know so he 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 kind of changed the politics of it to be a little bit more underhanded i think right. in, that, in that world and ever since then i you have to understand that there's a lot of politics going on with that stuff and so it's not just worth it's not well, just yeah worth and and there are for instance i mean for me one of the great uh uh, failures of the system as the year uh, Hereditary came out. And to me, Tony Collette did the performance of the year, but she didn't even get nominated. And because we don't do horror films, you know, generally, it's certainly not something that intense. So I think that, that, yeah, there's just, you know, part of it is also, I've, uh, is that people often think, well, how come all these people aren't voting for the people I want? It's just like, well, do you realize how many of the, uh, the Academy members are not young? They're not yeah. cool hip people anymore. <laughs> and right. also they and, you know, it's also it's not just the actors and actresses and directors and producers. It's all the people in all the different fields, whoever I think it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the Academy made up of everyone who's won awards in the past? Um, uh, I actually don't know how you get in into the Academy. I think um, I thought you had to be just in a prominent position in whatever you, it is that you do. Yeah, um, well, that's a good. But I, 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 don't quote me on that. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah. So Hollywood often has. Uh, it's you know you're often people are often saying how come they're not doing this yet? Well, it's because you've got a huge wing of the people who are members who are from an older generation. So it's yeah. like things move yeah. quickly, and that's fine because these people worked hard to get there. So you don't want to kick them out. Like okay, you're 65 now. <clears throat> You know, only yeah. only cool right. young people get to vote. Yeah. So, well, I don't. Yeah, you can't look at it as actually bestowing any worth. What I look at it as is a window in to what people are finding valuable at any given time, which right. includes a lot of status games, a lot of politics, a lot of other. Oh, yeah. yeah. So so that's it's a window into that. And if you look at it that way, then you can find it interesting. But in terms exactly. of, you know, I, I think this person deserves to be recognized or something that's like. You know, that's not what it's for. It's no. to promote the movies. That's what it's for. <laughs> exactly. Okay, Justin. Well, uh, I've enjoyed our talk and uh, we'll do this again. Uh, yeah. Probably not till I get back in April from my, mm-hmm. I'm going to be gone for a month. So I'm going to Alaska to load my a, a container, which will then become my container. And uh, then I'll have to try to find its way here. And then I will uh, eventually have it. But then, of course, at that point, I won't have built my shelves yet because the shelves cost X amount of dollars to build uh, because wood here is really expensive. So it'll take me a while to go from these things in boxes to things on shelves, like a year or two. But, you know, uh, I, once they're here, I'll be so happy because <laughs> it's yeah. like, okay, <laughs> this, this thing's always on the back of my head. But now it's like, uh, I was I was doing this yesterday and I was closing in on my twelve thousand dollar goal. And this guy calls up and oh, I didn't call it, but he sent a, a message and it was just like a thousand dollars. I said, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's just like, OK, we're there. We did it. You know, it's just yep. and, and wow. I often think, you know, there were 12 people out there who listened to my show who could have just done this and and wrapped it up really quickly. But, you know, <laughs> I thought, but I thought to myself, I really appreciated talking with all the people during this. And yesterday had a conversation with that guy plus two other people at once. And we had a very interesting conversation. And that's what's important to me. It's uh, I'm glad that it didn't all happen at once because yeah. that way I get a chance to interact with people. Mm-hmm. So uh, we will meet again. All right. Well, have fun. Have have fun on your adventure, your Alaska adventure. Draw a beat. Thanks. For <laughs> we will do it again. Right. Thanks, Brent. Well, a very interesting conversation, as always, with Justin. And, uh, yeah, watch a few movies. Support movies in theaters. Uh, help keep the art form alive. 
A lot of people just go the easy route and they just watch everything streaming. That is killing uh, not only movies and theaters, but physical media as well that you could possess yourself. Meanwhile, these large streaming companies take things away from us and there's no way to watch them, especially if you're just streaming. So, well, next time you hear from me, I will be on my way to Alaska. This is Burns saying, throw a beat. Thank you for everyone who's helped me raise the money to do this, even though it's not the complete job. It will be enough to boost the channel and get all those uh, wonderful CDs with my lectures and radio shows, among other things, back to Tbilisi, Georgia. Draw a beat. We will meet again. A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.